It's often lamented that nothing breaks like the heart, but it's equally true that nothing beats like the heart. And Pluto's heart is about to have revenge on all the astrophysicists who demoted it from its planetary status. This is the secret of how Pluto got its heart. In my last video, I touched on Pluto as an example of how we can use the Lorenz equations to predict orbital periodicity. My quick glance at Pluto caused me to look at it again and make this video about it in detail. The great thing about Pluto is we really didn't know that much about it before 2015. So the theories and the science around it aren't really that established yet. And so I'm not going to rock too many boats here as I will with my Earth Moon hypothesis. It wasn't even until 2015 when the New Horizons mission gave us some really clear visuals of the surface and its moon system and much more of an idea of what was going on. And until then, it looked like this. This is the best image we had from the Hubble telescope. And what's really amazing is that this mission coincided with Pluto passing the path of the elliptical of the rest of the planets. And after 2015 in the New Horizons mission, we have these amazing, beautiful images. And ever since then, people have vaguely wondered where Pluto got its heart. And so I'm going to explain to you my theory on how I think it got it. And it aligns with all of my previous work, and it didn't take much work to suss it out. Scientists have named this formation the Sputnik Planitia, or Planitia, I'm not sure. And it is mainly composed of methane, ice and nitrogen ice in major dunes and it is generally featureless with very little crater impacts on it and to the side of it there are many crater impacts and so this Sputnik Planitia or whatever you want to call it the heart is very very interesting and it drives much of what's going on on Pluto including its atmosphere but its topography looks like this and it is a giant indentation in the surface and there are several theories about how it came to be, but one of them is naturally a giant impact from a planetoid during the early solar system. And this was proposed by one of the New Horizon scientists, and his name was Francis Nemo, and he works at UC Santa Cruz. Him and his team modeled how the heart could have formed if the basin was produced by an impact, such as the one that created Sharon. And it's a testament to what the NASA scientists and New Horizon scientists can do that the prediction of tectonic activity around the heart somewhat matched up with what they found. The major exception being here up in the top right, the green line moving vertically. And so it really does appear that some kind of massive event happened on Pluto. However, if we take a closer look at Sharon and Pluto, and the fact that they're mutually tidally locked and have a 2 to 1 diameter ratio, it's hard not to reach the conclusion that the impact was from Sharon, not something like Sharon. And that, in fact, giant impacts don't happen the way that astrophysicists think that they do between moons and their planets. And that what happens as planets approach, they actually blow off parts of their surface instead of impacting. And that that blow off happens between where they're approaching, which causes them to move away. And Pluto has a few really good examples of this. But essentially, my thesis is that this mass being blown off causes the moon to shrink. And so I think Sharon started out much larger, closer in size to Pluto, just as I think that our moon did the same and lost mass at the mares and that the mares were not formed by comet impacts. They were caused by the moon diving towards the Earth. And while this flies in the face of planetary formation theory, it's actually super easy to show and really obvious if you just look at it and uh, blow up the pictures. And I don't blame anybody for not seeing it. We didn't have images like this 20 years ago that we could just do this in programs where we could just overlay images and do all this stuff so easily that it's possible for a dummy like me to figure it out. It's going to require a little bit of imagination, but I'll show you how it works. So if we just flip and invert Sharon and increase it in size to almost the size of Pluto, we can see that the northern pole tholine concentration matches up in shape to the shape of the heart on Pluto, at least one of the lobes. And when we do that, we can see that the line of the giant chasm that runs along the entire surface of Sharon is actually from an impact, and the surface was blown away. And that's how a planet or a moon shrinks, not by hitting and then congealing back together. It approaches, blows pieces off, and it shoots off like this. And so we've only mapped 
40 to 50 percent of Sharon and Pluto. And so we don't know, but we suspect that this chasm goes all the way around the planet. And this one right here is over 1,100 miles long. And I know these scientists are looking at this and they can tell what happened, but they just can't tell the public right out because it flies in the face of everything that they've been teaching forever. But John Spencer at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, where I live as well, I think I've seen this guy around, I swear. He said, it looks like the entire crust of Sharon has been split open. I couldn't agree more, John, and I'd love to talk to you about this because... When I went to your page and I saw that your favorite quote is, the history of cosmology is not the easy rejection of absurd ideas in favor of what, perhaps after a little thought, is seen to be patently true, but the heroic saga of the hard-won rejection of the patently true in favor of the absurd. I knew you were my guy. And I kind of doubt that we'll get a chance to fly by Pluto again anytime soon, but the Argo Chasma... If we could look around this, I almost guarantee you that this is a round shape around the edge of Sharon. This is a piece of crust that would have broken off but didn't. That's why it has a 5.5 mile deep chasm, just like the depths of some of the mares on the Earth moon. So let's just walk through the rest of how this impact would have happened and show you a little bit more of the evidence and how I work. It's not really that hard, and um, anybody can do this if you have the mindset that it's possible. It's very, very easily accessible. I did this with the Earth all across the Earth and found amazing things. And you should watch my other videos to check that out. But anyway, so there is a second kiss as the moon turns and starts to move away after the first major impact where it sheds mass to Pluto and its rear surface gets blown away. Now to really illustrate this point, I had to take a different map and show you this with actual topography. And this is super cool. So this is what they look like normally. This is a two scale model of their surfaces now. So what I did was blow Sharon up to about the same size as Pluto. And I'll just hold it here to see if you guys see what I saw because it's really obvious. The highlands and lowlands are inverted. And so what I did was pulled Sharon over, lined up those lines, and then I just started playing with it. So here's what you get. And considering that these lines are perpendicular to these two bodies' axial tilt to the elliptical plane, it's probably safe to say that this is the angle with which they approached each other at. No? I mean, it makes sense to me, right? Well, the way I check these alignments to see if they make sense is to increase the transparency of the top image. And in doing so, I get to see how other lines align underneath. And when I do so, I find really interesting patterns that make it make more sense which is what the red arrow indicates. So watch as I lighten Sharon over Pluto. And complex craters, in my opinion, are formed by the arcs of energy being exchanged, the plasma arcs, not by comet impacts. And I use them as markers for the spin between the two bodies. And that's why there's a highland on Pluto, right where this complex crater overlies it on Sharon. And then I go back and cross-reference other maps, such as Pluto's topography, and I see that the highlands are here to the south southeast of the indentation in the topography. And so using that as a clue, I did one more overlay just to kind of see if there was anything else I could find. With the moon, I have many, many different overlays in, in the time sequence of the approaches. Uh, this, I just kind of wanted to get a general feel for it. And so what I found next was an alignment between the complex craters on Sharon and Pluto. And you have to use a little bit of imagination because arcs of lightning going between two spheres are not going to align perfectly. You have to imagine it in a, in a rolling kind of pattern or a swirl or a torus or a hurricane um, swirling around between both surfaces. It's kind of hard, but once you get the gist of it, it makes a lot of sense. And so the interesting thing you find when you align these last plasma arcs is that the center of the complex crater on Sharon actually moves down that line and it moves to what looks like the center of a, a rough circle. Or maybe you see a hexagon. And you might even see multiples since this is a fractalization pattern of shock waves leaving imprints in 2D with three lines coming off of it. And so these complex craters represent not just lightning but also mass and matter and molten material that is being strewn back and forth between them uh, in the heat of their close proximity. And so the second lobe is actually a high lens because it represents the move away of Sharon from Pluto, whereas the indentation on the left represents the approach. 
And that's how you get a mutually tidally locked moon and planet or subplanet. And not to harp on it, but you can see from the orbital pattern that this is a fractalization breaking away of Pluto from Neptune and the moons and asteroids from Pluto. And in the cosmology that I propose, these pieces break off and become either submoons or near planet asteroids with planet resonant orbit. And so I believe that these other moons of Pluto are probably pieces of this system, and that's why they're tumbling and they will break apart and eventually move away to become near planet asteroids. And I really think that that's probably true of Arakoff, the other asteroid that they flew by after they left Pluto and Charon. Because as stated previously, I believe that things happen through fractalization, not accretion. And I just don't see how this makes sense. It just looks like magical thinking to me. And when I find things like this on Earth, they're usually breaking apart after being whittled down by weathering, not coming together and sticking. Anyway, now that I've cleared that up, I just want to talk a little bit more about how Pluto's heart actually shapes its weather. And I think how this is a great model of how the moon shaped Earth's weather and created the water on Earth's surface and life on Earth. Because the thing about the red dust on Charon's North Pole and outside of Pluto's heart is that it's mainly tholins, which are the precursors to amino acids. So the heart of Pluto is actually its coldest part, even though it's at its equator because of the axial tilt and plane of rotation and Charon. It's actually quite cold, but it drives all the weather on Pluto. And I think in the future, this is going to be a really important thing to examine in terms of how life formed on Earth. Because what we see is that around the heart shape is where water lands. And that's actually also where the tholins. And so the tholins and water are in the same area. And together, those are the basic building blocks of life. Pluto's heart is mainly nitrogen ice and methane ice, as well as water and carbon ice. But the process of heating and cooling this methane and nitrogen ice leads to the formation of water, which lands as uh, snow on top of the peaks on Pluto and even leaves a few spots of exposed water ice, though most gets covered up in the tholins. Finally, I just want to mention a few things about Pluto's atmosphere, which is pretty cool. The New Horizons team took this beautiful eclipse photo and caught the halo of Pluto's atmosphere and saw that it had a blue tint. And like our atmosphere, this is mainly due to the nitrogen. And finally, for you astrology folks out there and people who understand time cycles, it's really important to recognize the 248-year Pluto cycle and question its influence on the Earth. For those of you not inclined to astrology, I highly recommend that you keep watching my videos and subscribe and learn about the scientific actual cause of astronomy and astrology being the same thing and inseparable. And if you like this video, make sure to hit the like button. Thanks, guys.